Benjamin Haddad. Please take your seats. We will uh, make an effort to address all of the questions, or at least most of the questions you've been sending. That's the way we want to uh, establish this dialogue. We wanted to make this Q&A session to look a little bit different, as you can see from the sitting arrangement, and then uh, we will go for lunch. So, we have very interesting, highly varied questions, that's the good news, all ready for our experts. And thanks to the interpretation services, by the way, uh, We've been told that the people are particularly happy to have a Basque booth as well for the Basque language, one of the comments that was sent. Uh, another comment uh, was very few women in this field, right, Ainoa? You're nodding, yes? Yes, I was saying one of the comments we were sent, uh, not many ladies, not many women in this field. The comment said that women have uh, an important role in what is to come in cybersecurity, surely. Well, I can only agree uh, with that comment. Unfortunately, when I attend meetings and when I have uh, a picture taken in a group, I, I like wearing something bright. Today I'm wearing a, br a red jacket. Why? Because I want to be seen. You know, I'm usually the only one. Only recently in Finland, of all places as well, I was at a workshop and I was the only woman there. Let me tell you that uh, at university, our students tend to be 50-50 uh, young men and women. But that's not the case uh, in the industrial field, in the industrial world or now in cybersecurity. Unfortunately, two more women were going to be speaking at a conference here today and tomorrow. One from the European Security Network, a lady who unfortunately cancelled at the last minute, and also Elena from INCIDE was going to be the speaker for INCIDE. But the comment is quite right. So, another comment said and reminded us that in Gipuzkoa, that Gipuzkoa is good evidence and proof of talent in the field of cybersecurity. And the question is, how can SIUR, the new center, help to make this more visible, make it obvious and clear in our community that we have that talent here already. Well, SIUR has two main objectives. Let's not forget that. SIUR will be reinforcing our industry, our firms in the event of a cyber attack. And the second main objective is promoting specialization and training in cybersecurity. Thinking about those two objectives, there's no doubt that uh, cybersecurity companies uh, are fundamental and they should be at the core of everything we do. And that's why SIUR will be uh, connecting those companies uh, with other firms and with other uh, stakeholders at other levels so they can make the most of their existing resources, so they can test their products of ser or and services, so we can be better connected with international stakeholders. And here I would like to stop and remind you that in the past uh, we have been working with some niche cybersecurity companies, but those are just a few of uh, the rest. There are many more that will have access to this open, the nature is that it will be an open center. So we can make talent visible and uh, we can make the most of it uh, for our strategic. Uh, Benjamin, and uh, the question is, 
She's asking in English, John. Opinion uh, about uh, the real commitment of the European <coughs> institutions in order to support or to boast uh, an a structure and a strategy to develop cybersecurity strategies in the different countries. And they ask about, the, if, in your opinion, is there a real commitment in this field? I, and I missed, I'm sorry, uh, I've, I've, uh, run, I've run out of ears. Uh, I, I missed the first part of the, the first, question. More, more than a question, people, I think it's more than a clear question. Is your opinion about the uh, commitment of the European institutions at the different countries, in your opinion, if they are really in the same page, <laughs> if they are singing for the, for, for the okay. same page? Okay, thank you. Well, I, I, can, I can say from first-hand knowledge, um, for many years, uh, I've been working with uh, the uh, Council of Europe, mm -hmm. um, particularly on uh, cybercrime and uh, supporting the spread of the Budapest Convention to many countries outside of Europe, um, and with various departments in the Commission. Um, and uh, we were very happy to be involved in the setup of the European Cybercrime Centre at Europol. Um, and I have noticed over these last four or five years uh, a real growth in the commitment uh, within the Commission and the other institutions to be leaders in cybersecurity, to help the 27, 28 member states um, to implement the best cybersecurity strategies that are available. So I I'm really encouraged by the effort by the investment that uh, European institutions are making in order to help the security of the entire EU family. Uh, I have to say that um, some of the member states are quite far behind and will need more help than others uh, in, this, in this journey, but I'm really <coughs> encouraged and I believe that they, are, they have the best interests of, of those member states. In, in investing in the future of cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, about European policies and you know, more than that, uh, uh, focused on the state, on the on the, um, on the, uh, the uh, state of the art in terms of uh, research and innovation and development in Europe, comparing with some other parts. And this is a question for you, uh, Luigi. Because uh, they say, according to your knowledge of the state of, the art, of art in relation to civil security, what does Europe need? And in a more con concrete way, perhaps comparing with Israel, and maybe Benjamin could add some other point of views. Well, what do this, we need? This is a <laughs> question we would need full conference. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, to simplify, well, let's say I will start from investment. Investment because Europe, both as Europe and as uh, national or local level, we still, uh, still have a very low level of investment. I mentioned before, at best in the future, we will have some, something like 500, 600 million of euro per year, 2021, this is my estimation. Uh, today is still much less, and, and when you compare with the, what is invested uh, in the, the States and other big countries, investments are much higher. You don't need to have only public sector investment. You, if for instance, in Israel, you, you have this uh, already for many years, this, mm -hmm. this national, uh, in, uh, I think it's innovation, it's translation is innovation uh, fund. Uh, which is really pushing all, which is supporting the development of startups and innovation in general. And this is led by, by the government, actually. So it's a national, uh, but, but this is thanks to the understanding of the politician of the, of the need for such investment fund, and also for the better understanding of the, uh, of the need for the economic sector. And this is what is missing. Well, coming back maybe to the question uh -huh. that you said to ask to John, yeah. Yeah. Um, he was very positive. I would be a little bit more negative just to <laughs> challenge it. Huh? Uh, we started yesterday evening. <laughs> um, a bit more negative in the sense that the Commission is just understanding, starting to understand what cybersecurity is, what 
the European uh, digital, uh, single digital market is and what are the needs. And on top of that, the Commission and the Parliament have a strong constraint because on one hand, they want to build up something in common. At the same time, when it comes to security, they have to deal, as I said before, with the sovereignty of the different countries, which are limiting the dialogue, which are limiting the exchange of information, which are somehow limiting the cooperation. And it's a matter of maturity, but also the different sectors, they have problems to talk each other, to cooperate with each other, as I said also, in the example I gave before on certification. So all this needs a certain time to build the understanding. So the, I think what I want to say is that the Commission really needs to understand, and is still lacking, the real, what the industry wants, what the industry needs in cybersecurity. So they have a vision from Brussels, and when you come to the reality like here in a region, and you understand what are the needs, you see that there's still a mismatch. Mm -hmm. So the strategy, nice politically correct strategy that you build up in, in Brussels is not really what the very basic sometimes uh, requests which are coming from industry in the field. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Benjamin, do you agree with this? Uh, I, yes, yeah? yes, uh, to a large extent. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh -huh. I would speak up. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes to, uh, I, I, to a large extent I agree with all was, was said. There is a lot of uh, very interesting studies that try to understand what makes uh, an innovation cluster successful. There are many attempts around the world. In Europe, it's been 10, maybe 15 years that we are trying to replicate a Silicon Valley model and been unsuccessful, mm -hmm. to be honest, uh, with some exception. Um, and, uh, and the role of the military uh, is often very well documented in uh, helping a successful uh, innovation uh, cluster grow. Uh, it has always had a very important role, whether you are talking about cybersecurity or other domains of, of innovation, uh, military definitely always had its role, both in America, in Israel, and in other places, uh, as the availability of venture capital, as the uh, you know, entrepreneurial mindset. I think another uh, and government uh, role that you mentioned is very important, but um, I think something that has been critical um, and differentiating for specifically the case of Israel uh, and its success story was the fact that actually you had a lot of uh, corporate R&D, uh, a lot of uh, leading corporate centers coming there to uh, do R&D exclusively. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and that, I think, has helped uh, a journey where you have basically a very small country facing gigantic threats and everybody knows about it. So that means that essentially you have swaths of population that are very early on in their life uh, sensit sensitized to, to, to the problems in cyber, to technology. And at university, re at, at um, the army receive a training that is equivalent to a university degree. But then typically um, the journey goes uh, with a first step in your career at an R&D center of a leading multinational corporate. You are part of this and you start understanding the applied problems that you were talking about. When you go work for the R&D center of uh, ABB, of Siemens, of uh, Citibank, you start having the real world knowledge of what a trader in London is struggling with, of what an uh, um, industrial production line is really concerned about, and then you move out and create a startup. And that combination, I think, of you know, mindset, venture capital availability, government uh, support, but also sometimes need to f create their people uh, uh, more awareness, matched with the role of multinational R&D center, then, then that's, that's a secret sauce. I think that's, that's hard to replicate, but that's, uh, that's proven to be quite mm -hmm. successful. Perhaps harder to replicate, and that's another question straight to you, because they are talking about, and yes, <laughs> John, I'll give you the, the, mm, the, thank uh, you. the chance. There are, uh, some people are asking about um, what do we need to do in Gipuzkoa, considering the size of the territory, considering the, the companies we've got, to create this startup ecosystem in cybersecurity. But in your opinion, do we need? <laughs> uh, but it, it's, uh, it's a good question, and, um, and, and I'd love to collaborate more. We, we're, we're talking okay. a little bit about it. I, th I think, you know, um, Israelis have failed when they tried to replicate what America was strong in. Uh, it goes back to the theory of competitive advantage, I suppose. Uh, trying to do exactly uh, what others are hyper successful at maybe is uh, not always the best strategy. Uh, I think there is a huge role, though, for better partnership. Uh, 
Uh, on one side of the equation, you have a country uh, that sometimes feels a little bit isolated and far from everything, far from their customers, far from uh, exactly the understanding of what they need. And on the other side, you have ecosystems such as these that are prioritizing in a very clear and uh, ambitious way cybersecurity. Rather than creating a small uh, Basque country version of Israel, why not uh, increasing the links between the region? Um, we are seeing some effective programs with Germany, with Italy, with many regions around the world where it is really about aggregating uh, by industries or by sub-industries uh, a series of problems and then creating innovation jams, creating accelerators, creating uh, innovation roadshow where uh, we bring the best of the innovation from there into here so that it solves the problems today. Rather than trying to, it's very hard to build an innovation ecosystem mm -hmm. and you have a, a, like a lot of documents on how unsuccessful the countries have been around the world in doing that. Thank you. And John. By the way, sorry, so, that's uh, exactly uh, what we are doing in EXO, uh, linking the region. Uh, we start. <laughs> sorry. 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 Yeah. So, so, don't hesitate to interrupt me, of course, and interrupt yourself. <laughs> no, if I may, I'd like to add to the other side of the coin. And I fully support um, uh, what Benjamin is saying about innovation and not one size fits all. Mm -hmm. But I have the thing that about getting back to the basics um, for businesses in Kaputskwa that I think is worth just re-emphasizing, okay? Because whilst we're building up the innovation and skills and, uh, and attracting ladies into the profession, um, the businesses that are operating here and now have got issues that need to be fixed immediately, okay? So I'm not saying, you know, none of that is, is poor. We should be doing that. But in parallel, and at the same time, there are some very basic steps that every company in Kaputsa could take to make themselves more secure immediately. Mm -hmm. Very simple, straightforward, mm -hmm. technical security controls. Uh, we'll have a list of them at the center, which you know, our job will be to share with you and in, by supporting our technical security companies, they can help with a small amount of consultancy and work. So it's a, it's a bit like home. If you imagine how many times have I been asked, uh, if you know anything about computers, your, your aunt or your grandmother or your mother says, uh, John, how do, I, <coughs> how do I secure this new laptop I bought? <laughs> well, you know, keep your operating system up to date Keep your antivirus and security suite up to date and don't click on links from people you don't know, okay? So those are the basics for home if you like. And there are some very simple things that every business can do which are not expensive, can be done immediately and will mitigate up to 80% of common online threats, okay? They won't help you fight the Chinese but they will help you fight the, the digital cyber carpet bombing that we're seeing every day, okay? So I'd like us to, to start with the basics also. Thank mm -hmm. you. Interesting to see that people is commenting, you know, I do it, for example, they are commenting on your comments, and they are <laughs> just <laughs> adding those, those other points of view, so it's very interesting to see that we are really uh, talking to, to, to each other. Um, Alex, Beneta Berriro, aipatzen da, galdera tan, betiko... Alex? sectore privado a men no le va a ir descansen a llegará perdón pero no nos llega sonido a cabina estaremos sorry but the sound is not reaching the booth uh, we'll be back hopefully as soon as it does apologies oh now the question is how can we have better synergies between the private and the public sector and also collaborating with public institutions because we've heard about synergies, for instance, between SIUR, the center, and uh, other stakeholders. It sounds like uh, we're doing things right in the Basque country in this sense, right? Well, public-private partnership is paramount uh, right now in this field, and it's not that hard, in fact, because we have 
public institutions on the one hand uh, that need to have clear objectives and then um, it's um, ever so simple really my uh, training and my experience uh, was in the private sector so what needs to be done public institutions need to listen to the companies to uh, the technology experts and then uh, set in motion projects and there are many success stories uh, of uh, projects and activities that have been very very successful that's the key to the success uh, of a ppp for instance uh, benjamin mentioned uh, the possibility of building bridges for instance between the Basque country in and Israel that would be a partnership that would be a collaboration and for that to succeed we would just need to listen to one another what well, is the same thing if it's uh, a PPP here listen to one another and uh, have the necessary tools another question has to do uh, with the industrial fabric here in Gipuzkoa, which 80% uh, of them are SMEs uh, that tend to have more uh, difficulties in this sense. What would be the immediate uh, steps that an SME should take to improve uh, in the field of cybersecurity for SMEs? Uh, what should they do immediately, in your opinion? Can you hear this mic okay? Great. Well, um, an SME logically doesn't have all the need resources a larger company has access, access to. They don't have uh, security experts close at hand either. And because of that, uh, awareness is basic for an SME uh, and diagnose uh, where they are at which point they are so they they can have a starting point and then I totally agree there are some basics basic very simple basic principles any SME can or micro enterprise should implement very very basic ones I insist so these basic points or best practices uh, really make a difference talking about digital security or cyber security. I feel there are times that financial resources for training of staff uh, tends to be one of the main barriers or when they hire somebody uh, maybe not having access always uh, to people with those skills because it costs more money. But still, uh, sometimes it makes sense to invest a little bit uh, in cybersecurity, and we have seen very recently how and why. We've seen cases, not particularly SMEs, in fact, uh, that have been very badly hurt. We've had cases uh, with uh, companies pleading us uh, to please uh, recover a hard disk drive with uh, payroll information or with uh, ciphered uh, information that is vital for a particular company and they can't have access to it, they can't access it because of ransomware. We see more and more those situations uh, which can be avoided uh, if those basic steps and a little bit more investment is done also by SMEs. Sorry, I should have told you that if anybody else wants to uh, say anything, you're getting the interpretation okay, yes? Right, uh, another question. What would you say to a CEO in a small company if you had an interview this afternoon? So uh, he or she can stop saying, uh, can stop talking about costs and spending on uh, cybersecurity and talk about investment. Who wants to answer that question? Any of you? Well, uh, I would ask them to, I would ask him or her to look at their balance sheet, and that would probably say a lot. Because cybersecurity is not just about defenses and protection. 
uh, the regional minister said it very well. It's, it also adds value and competitiveness to products, to your products or services, or you should do. That's why uh, I said, looking at the balance sheet uh, for that particular company, I would point out, can you imagine what would happen if your manufacturing plant uh, all of a sudden had to stop because of some of these problems? Or what uh, would happen if your product could have more added value? to guess uh, what exactly you're saying, but uh -huh. you're saying what will encourage the adoption of more security practice on an ongoing yeah. basis rather than... Mm -hmm. So I, I think, I think uh, the disappointing answer is that people won't have a chance to choose whether to adopt more security in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, the, we are seeing a clear trend for, uh, from the regulators to impose measures to adopt security in everything that a uh, company does. GDPR is an excellent example of that. It's the most radical uh, re revision of data protection law in the last 20 years, and it imposes on every company that holds EU citizen data, which is about every company in their CRM, in their financial system, in their every company of even small uh, size holds EU personal data. The GDPR says if you do hold that, you will have to build security by design and by default in every product and in every process that you have as a company. And if you don't, you will have fines up to 4% of your revenue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, to, and, and there are other examples than GDPR, uh, that there are drives, for example, to uh, better understand the security risk of all your third-party suppliers. Now, if you're a logistical supply company, your whole business is depending on that. And your clients will have imposition from regulators more and more around the world, it's converging, uh, that are saying basically to the board of directors, it's your responsibility to understand if your supplier is cyber resilient or not. And so, mm -hmm. yes, of course, mm -hmm. competitive advantage. There are the tier three, uh, you know, forward looking thinking type of customers who are proactive. But uh, I think the good news actually is that companies will have to comply to a much more cyber secure uh, world in this area of, uh, you know, in the in the developed nation, and then and then and then the rest of the world hopefully will follow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to the CEO, I would say, um, bring your accountant along, right? Your financial director, <laughs> and I would say, look at the amount of money you're spending on ICT, information technology products, smartphones through to servers to, to cloud services, and if you're not dedicating at least 20% of that cost to securing it, then you're not spending enough. And to give them some measure of, of what to budget for. And then we can sit down and talk about how to spend that wisely. Mm -hmm. 20%, okay, right. I know as the Right, we have another question for Ainoa, because the provincial governments in the Basque Country uh, are very special institutions uh, in the Basque Country, in this particular region, because they can raise taxes. The Basque Country is different uh, from the rest of Spain in that sense. Thanks to that, uh, in uh, the Basque Country, uh, we can also have a lot, of, uh, a lot more power for regulations uh, and uh, how hopefully uh, we can help companies. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. The Gipuzkoa provincial government uh, has many challenges ahead of us, uh, but uh, I'm thinking of two of them right now in this sense. We want to help our industry, our companies be more competitive, and the other one is guaranteeing well-being in our community, in our society. And when we draft uh, our industrial policy, uh, we are very careful to comply with those two uh, objectives. And uh, so that is well aligned as well with our fiscal policy and with others like education and training, um, 
or promoting entrepreneurship. And those are the areas that we try to subsidize or we try to uh, offer financial aid. And only yesterday, we have new incentives and um, uh, allowances that we're going to have new ones uh, and which areas are going to be priority for us. And in the near future, I can tell you that one of those priority areas will be is going to be cybersecurity, and then we will have uh, some activities, and uh, we will have possibilities also for patronage uh, and with tax allowances, uh, so we can better promote uh, this particular industry. Oh, we've also have some questions in the social media. One of them is, why would I subcontract uh, my cybersecurity in my company? Why should I do that so? Why should I pay for those services if I have INCIBE or those centers to help me? Why should I pay for it? So, uh, is it a question for you then? Well, it is true that INCIBE offers services, which we don't want to for them to overlap uh, with products and services that private companies provide. In fact, we are hoping that our services uh, can, or we can guide uh, people who come to us uh, to those companies uh, that can provide them with those services. So once again, we don't want to um, do the same as private companies can do. Uh, we, we don't offer an audit, for instance, uh, as companies can do. We offer services and help that maybe they can't get anywhere else, uh, connected with awareness or training tools, uh, so they can understand uh, what cybersecurity is about, and so that they're more aware, and they can go to firms, private firms, uh, for those services. We need to explain to them how they can be more uh, cyber secure with those services. Let me also tell you that uh, we don't provide any products or services that compete with the private sector. Why? Because the Basque Security Center has very, very clear that we want to promote uh, the private industry and private supply. And uh, we want to collaborate with those firms. So if somebody thinks they can come to us for a free service, uh, well, that's not the case, uh, because services we offer uh, are subcontracted with private firms. And there's a tender, there's bidding for it. Uh, so when services are provided by us, it's private companies uh, that do so. Why? Because the Basque Security Center, uh, to be able to provide ourselves uh, any of those services, we would have maybe 50, uh, 60 people uh, working for us. So that's not a problem at all. Well, I think representatives from all three institutions that have been present here, uh, I think we've all tried to explain that we don't want to compete uh, with the private sector. And when we've done the study, the diagnosis, the monitoring, uh, we have been working with them, with private companies. Benjamin, a question for you in English. Innovative initiatives in cybersecurity in the last, let's say, two years. You have you mentioned this, mm -hmm. the Middle Ages, and that we are moving very slowly for the new era. In the two years, perhaps um, is the most innovative cybersecurity uh, solutions or attacks. <laughs> <laughs> the 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 question says both, both. solutions, both. but I would like to add also attacks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so. Because of the always evolving threat landscape, sophistication of the threats, uh, explosion of threats, you know, there are statistics that say every week you have one million new malwares. 
Sometimes it's mutation of existing malware. You take a malware, the code of the malware, you switch some lines of the code, and it's a, it's a mutation. It's the same family, but slightly different. Still manages to bypass all your uh, uh, protection. And then there are what we call APTs, like uh, very sophisticated malware is also an explosion of it. The, 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 the increasing uh, complexity of this threat landscape has meant that you have had over the last 10 years, a uh, very big, very significant amount of entrepreneurs seeing an opportunity and saying, okay, to this threat, I will propose this solution. To this threat, I will propose this solution. And uh, the result of this in the uh, corporate market, in the enterprise environment, is that uh, it has created a lot of complexity. In, uh, uh, there, there, are, there are, again, good statistics around how many cybersecurity products uh, the average enterprise is utilizing. And this is about 20 to 30, sometimes it goes, uh, you know, it grows in complexity with the size as well, 50 security products in many enterprises. All of them not build to talk to each other in the case of an incident. And so for me, um, overall, the uh, you know, innovation belongs to hackers, unfortunately. Um, and uh, very, very sophisticated hackers. Now, you, you have to get, get away from that mentality of a hacker is just a, a, a bad boy with his uh, you know, a hoodie in a dark corridor in some uh, university. These are nation states, uh, mm -hmm. well equipped with a lot of budget from these uh, nations to do major attacks on infrastructure, on entire hospitals, on entire, it, it, it is really an increasing sophistication. And that's the, that's, that's the innovation. The, na the nation state attackers such as China, such as Russia, such as Iran, are uh, the big innovators in cybersecurity. On the solution side though, because we have reacted in, and, and created such a fragmented environment, for me, the, one of the most uh, interesting solution innovation is around uh, what we call SOC automation and orchestration. Uh, SOC is a security operation center where all these security products are being managed. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a lot of fatigue from the people who work in these environments. Uh, mm -hmm. if, you, if we have some of them here, maybe you recognize yourself in that. The, they have to react constantly to false positive, to an attack, and when there is an attack, make sure that they write uh, Python code so that the attack that infected one product is not going to go into the other product. Very manual, very reactive, very terrible job. And uh, one of the good innovation there has been really uh, artificial intelligence solution that connect, that creates the sort of connecting tissue between all the different uh, security products that an enterprise has so that when there is an attack in, let's say, your mobile phone because you've responded to a, downloaded the wrong document, uh, it doesn't infect your network. Uh, it does it in an automatic way. It helps the security analysts in the SOC to sort of focus really on, on the key part and not just do this reactive manual work. So, yeah, I, I would say SOC automation and orchestration is one of my favorites. Uh, there has been a big acquisition re recently in that space. Um, and there are interesting uh, competitors as well. So mm -hmm. that's my long answer, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Something to add? Ba, hola, xe espaldin bada, besterik espadago agurtu behar dugun ez. Any further questions or comments from the floor? And if that's not the case, I, I would like to say something or repeat something that has been said here today uh, in one of the comments that were sent. Uh, I often tell my customers, the comment says, uh, we should have more common sense, uh, which is good not just uh, for cybersecurity in particular, but for life in general. So anyway, I want to thank... Uh, the person who sent that comment, uh, because I totally agree with it, and I want to thank our dear experts uh, for their presentations and for their comments and, and answers right now. We uh, are learning what the path is uh, and to stay on the right path together. Thank you. Right then. It's time now uh, to go for lunch. So we can come back all full of beans or whatever else is served.
That was a joke from the interpreter. But again, uh, we'll be back at three. Ready to start.